Good evening and welcome. We will start uh, the lecture number 38. Uh, lecture 37, we had looked at uh, several interesting elements. Let me just sort of quickly summarize. The key aspects was we looked at cyclic prefix based systems. Once you had the cyclic prefix based systems, we showed how the uh, multi carrier modulation with the block transceiver could be constructed and that was the point at which we had uh, completed. So uh, basically in today's uh, lecture we will introduce the OFDM framework and we will also look at some practical applications of OFDM in the technologies that we are familiar with. <coughs> so at a broad level we are trying to do transmission through a channel that has got time dispersion. We want to send a block of data and be able to recover it. In a, uh, in a very uh, uh, efficient manner at the other end. Uh, we have to worry about inter-block interference, intra-block interference and all of these have to be addressed in the system that we are designing. We agreed that there will be the benefits of redundancy. If you say there is no redundancy, it becomes a very uh, difficult system to work with, uh, complexity will increase. So we say that we will introduce redundancy to the extent that it will simplify the receiver structure. So at the transmitter, we will insert the redundancy. We show that uh, by the processing. But at the end of the day, we are doing time division multiplexing to frequency division multiplexing because that is what uh, will create for us a wideband signal. So that the FDM signal is what is the wideband signal which is what we want to transmit through the channel. And before we transmit we will introduce the redundancy and again uh, will it be part of the modulation process or will it be inserted post the modulation process. What we have found is that we need to introduce it after the modulation process because either zero insertion or cyclic prefix insertion is not part of the modulation, it is after we have done the modulation. So the uh, insertion of the uh, redundancy, removal of the redundancy, eventually getting back the signals from which we can make an estimate of the transmitted signal. So uh, a good way to visualize the introduction of redundancy in the transceivers that we are working with is uh, one is zero padding where we add the zeros, the number of zeros must be at least equal to the number of channel taps that you have in your uh, signal. It, it cannot be less, it can be more but at least um, and because we want the redundancy to be as minimum as, as small as possible, we want to keep it to the length of the channel tap. In the case of the cyclic prefix, we said that it will be the last new elements that you are transmitting you reproduce it at the head of the, uh, at the start of the transmission. So effectively the cyclic prefix gets added in both cases it becomes an n cross 1 vector. Now uh, in the case of the uh, cyclic, uh, in the zero insertion, the re final result is obtained via a pseudo inverse operation. Okay. Let me just uh, write that down. So s hat of n, the detected signal will be equal to the matrix C low that is derived from the uh, the the using the uh, the first m columns of the of the matrix uh, C low Hermitian C low inverse C low Hermitian times the received signal R of n. Okay, R of n has the uh, has the um, is is a um, has more observations than the number of uh, unknowns that we are trying to detect, so it becomes a least square solution, uh, least square problem for which we do the pseudo inverse. In the case of the uh, cyclic prefix case, we showed that we can obtain the final final result in terms of a matrix inversion, not a pseudo inverse, but a matrix inversion where we have the inversion of a, a circular matrix and we made the arguments why it would become a circular, uh, a circular matrix. So since we, that is the uh, key focus that we are interested in, let me just sort of quickly uh, give you the framework so then we can uh, complete today's discussion. <coughs> so the case where we have cyclic prefix, that is the one that is of interest to us. So the first step is we create the signal to be transmitted and that is done through the insertion of the cyclic prefix. So you take the, the input vector, input vector s of n uh, and in this case I, I just want to write down all of the, uh, the, uh, the matrix dimensions, it is important that we are able to capture that. This is a n cross 1 vector, this is a n cross m matrix, again it has only 1s and zeros. This is a m cross 1 and that will give you the vector that, uh, that we are interested in. And we also have another result which says that 
you will get a pseudo circulant matrix as part of the uh, uh, transmission through the channel and that we have uh, seen even in the case of the uh, uh, when, when we did the, the numerical examples the pseudo circulant matrix times FCP. This is an important one though FCP was actually associated with the, with the uh, transmitted signal you, uh, in the analysis we are associating it with the channel. So, this basically gives me a matrix CUP basically it, it, it takes off uh, uh, and uh, once you have this let me just make sure that we got the dimensions correct uh, CPC is a N cross N <coughs> matrix this is a N cross M matrix this is a N cross M matrix okay and after this if we do the cyclic prefix removal next step is the CP removal. CP removal changes the dimensions of this matrix. So, basically we do the cyclic prefix removal by nulling out some of the unwanted elements and that is shown by means of a matrix with zeros, m rows um, and new columns followed by an identity matrix times r of n and this will basically uh, cause this vector to interact with the CUP and the product of that gives us the resulting uh, equation that we want to work with. R hat of n becomes equal to the C circulant times S of n. Okay. So, uh, uh, again one let us just write down the dimensions. This is a m cross 1 matrix, the circulant matrix is m cross m and S of n is m cross 1. So, basically we have removed the, uh, the redundancy and then we finally get to working with this. So, the, the observation is that this vector 0 nu times I m times C u p actually is the one that gives us the circulant matrix. What is, re, what is, what is remaining is the, is the circulant matrix and that is what we are working with. Okay. So, the product or the property of the circulant matrix we will just quote from last time. We have shown that any circulant matrix can be written in terms of the normalized DFT matrix inverse gamma times W. Gamma is a diagonal matrix of the following elements uppercase C naught, uppercase C 1, uppercase C m minus 1. These are not the channel coefficients, they are the DFT of the channel coefficients. So, the C m equation is equal to summation, uh, there will be a 1 over root m, um, is that there or not? Uh, yes, basically 1 over root m. Uh, C subscript K W M K M uh, in, no, no. yes and K equal to 0 to M minus 1 basically the, the computation of the DFT. Okay. So, once you get the uh, DFT, but, uh, the, uh, the, but the coefficients uh, C K's are not M in number, what you have is C naught, C 1 up to C nu and then you add zeros remaining. How many zeros did we add? We added m minus nu plus 1 that many zeros you added and then computed the DFT and then you obtained it and this tells us that the circulant matrix can always be inverted with some uh, uh, my a small error which is which is negligible from our point of view and that will be equal to w inverse gamma inverse times w and uh, basically that is done by perturbing the if any of these uh, channel coefficients is very close to 0 you replace it with some uh, constant epsilon and then do that it's it's equivalent to the mmsc approach rather than doing zero forcing you find the uh, 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 solution but the reason we say that it does not affect us is that is that will happen on it on a particular sub channel that has got low SNR and, and you would not have done any transmission on that channel to begin with. So, really what happens there is not going to uh, not going to affect us. Okay. So, the key equation for us 
is uh, is the fact that we can obtain the uh, the uh, co uh, the co computation of the transmitted signal s hat of n by means of the following equation w inverse lambda inverse w times r hat of n that is the equation that is where we reached and th that is where we would like to pick up from in today's uh, class. Okay. So, I hope this part of it uh, is, uh, is clear and that you are comfortable with this in information. Let me just show you some of the slides from last time that, uh, we, that we drew. Okay. The insertion Okay. The insertion of the cyclic prefix. So, that happens through the multiplication with the FCP matrix. So, uh, we can see that that is uh, happening by, in, by adding some uh, new entries at, at the top. Then you, uh, you make it in from parallel to serial that becomes a signal with redundancy passing through the channel. Channel will do linear convolution that is always the case. But we showed that as we did the uh, with the, uh, the, the matrix, this is the overall matrix and once we did the uh, uh, CP removal, we, we showed that uh, what was left is uh, this matrix which is uh, CUP and then multiplied by FCP becomes a circulant matrix. So, that was the process that we had followed and that is when we came to this uh, conclusion. So, as I mentioned, uh, these channels where you are likely to cause you problems in the inversion of these circulant matrix uh, are not a problem for us because there is no transmission happening in this channel to begin with. So, therefore, we are uh, able to uh, uh, use this without any difficulty. So, the overall block diagram which should have included all of these portions which basically started with S of n the modulation or the, uh, the conversion uh, to um, NFDM signal, insertion of the CP, parallel to serial conversion passing through the channel, CP removal, the, the removal of the uh, conversion to TDM and then the uh, uh, separate signals. Simplified beautifully into a M cross M problem. This is a M cross M matrix where there are M inputs, M outputs and we are able to do it by a matrix that is guaranteed to be uh, to be invertible. Okay. So, uh, as we mentioned this is a, uh, a, a very very crucial point for us to uh, where we stopped. So, the extension to OFDM comes actually very very naturally OFDM. So, let us look once more at the uh, at the equation it says the uh, the transmitted signal r hat of n r hat of n uh, is equal to w inverse lambda times w times s of n okay uh, is it s of n or s hat of n uh, s of n <coughs> that's the that's the transmitted signal so the observation that uh, that comes from uh, and supposed to come very naturally once you look at this is uh, how do you get s of n s of n is supposed to be the modulated signal how did you how to generate there are different ways of generating it and one of the ways in which we can generate a, 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 a signal a modulated signal is by using the dft matrix so can we generate x of n through the following process w inverse times s of n okay uh, in fact i think i have made a mistake um, circular wait let me just let me just write down the equation this is the after we do the cyclic prefix removal before removing the cyclic prefix this is the following this is the equation r of n is equal to c circular Circulant times x of n plus eta of n. Eta of n is the is the noise term. Okay, so is, is this correct? Mm, or is it should be cup? Uh, I believe it should be. Okay, yeah, after I remove the. Um, after we pass it through the channel and then remove the uh, this thing it should be the yeah r of n 
is C circulum <coughs> times x of n. I, I think so. Let, let if you if you catch something wrong, just just let me know. So basically, what we want to do is x of n will be equal to the uh, matrix W inverse times S of n. Okay. So uh, uh, how do I get uh, instead of this one? I should I should be I should be writing there a x of n, the transmitted signal. So if I transmit W inverse times S of n, then it becomes W inverse lambda times W W inverse times S of n. Okay, yeah. So uh, S of n is the input. I pass it through the uh, IDFT matrix. I get X of n. I pass this through FCP and uh, basically get the with, get the uh, vector with the cyclic prefix. Pass it through the channel. At, at the other end, I have removed the cyclic prefix. So uh, basically, uh, the e equation that we get is the uh, expression as follows. So these two will will cancel each other, and what we are left with is the equation r hat uh, r of n rather r of n. R of n is equal to W inverse uh, lambda times S of n plus eta of n. If I take the DFT of this, W times R of n, that will become W times W inverse gamma times S of n plus W times eta of n that is basically some other noise vector. So, I will just label this as eta prime of n these two will cancel. So, if this becomes equal to my output y of n yeah yes that is my modulation step. I'm 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 defining it as uh, no, sir. ah the second step in the R hat of n here yeah I, 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 uh, yeah so this is actually not this is x right it's x okay is that okay yeah okay so uh, effectively what uh, the overall system becomes equal to is y of n is equal to lambda times s of n plus eta prime of n. Now, th this may seem like just yet another equation, but it is actually very, very profound. Let us see what exactly, what, what is it telling us. Uh, Rather than redraw this whole the whole picture, let me just sort of take you back to the uh, equation or what is needed for us in terms of the structure. <coughs> so, what is happening here is that I have to do the modulation and then insert the cyclic prefix. The modulation is being done by means of the IDFT process and then the cyclic prefix is getting inserted. So, that is that is the uh, that is the tra transmission side. So, if I do that and follow it at the receiver by doing the removal of the cyclic prefix and the uh, 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 the DFT, this is this is what it looks like. So, let me just draw a very very uh, quick block diagram. So, this is S naught of n all the way to S m minus 1 of n, I am passing it through the inverse DFT, normalized inverse DFT. Output will be m, this is a m cross m, this is a m cross m transformation. Now, uh, basically, we will do the CP insertion, okay. So, CP insertion and followed by the parallel to serial conversion parallel to serial 
this is of dimension n okay that that means you must up sample followed by the delays you will get a single signal which passes through the signal c of z noise also gets added so there is linear convolution with the noise getting in included then at the other end I have to remove the CP okay. So uh, basically let us let us do the uh, serial to parallel first then the removal so we will get these N outputs this is the CP removal CP removal and then what I will be left with is a uh, vector of dimension m, I am going to process it through a DFT process w and, and at, at the output I have the observations which are given by y, okay. These are the observations y0 of n are they equal to the corresponding s's uh, not quite uh, because what you are observing with is uh, scaled by a complex coefficient you cannot call that as y yet. So in order for us to so this is y m minus 1 of n how do I get the get to the last stage I would have to do scale it by the first branch by 1 over c0 the last branch by 1 over c m and then these would now be effectively s not hat of n all the way to s m minus 1 hat of n okay so this is my block transmission scheme where we have uh, introduced the uh, where modulation is done using the inverse dft and the reason i use the inverse dft was because i know that my circulant matrix which is effectively what is going to come in between my uh, tr transmitter and receiver can be uh, can be uh, can be uh, simplified i mean can be written as in it in a diagonalized form i'm taking advantage of that and making sure that i get and at the fi at the final stage <coughs> i just uh, do a 1 over c0 1 over cm uh, being transmitted Okay. Now, if this is a equivalent representation of C0, then the simplified representation is absolutely, absolutely uh, spectacular because now what you find is the equation is S0 of N, S1 of N, SM minus 1 of N it is as if each of these are getting multiplied by corresponding complex coefficients in the channel okay that is all that is happening as far as the channel is concerned. There is a noise term getting added to each of these branches this is eta naught of n this is a another addition term. eta 1 of n and then the last one eta m minus 1 of n these are the noise terms and uh, what we do at the other side is 1 over c0 1 over c1 1 over c m minus 1 that is the one that we do just before we declare the output and this is S0 hat of n, S1 hat of n, SM minus 1 hat of n. So the introduction of the DFT as your modulation matrix and the uh, sorry IDFT as the modulation matrix and the DFT as the one at the receiver <coughs> parallelized your channel. Okay, what was a single wideband signal uh, channel which could have caused you all kinds of problems with inter block interference, inter, inter sub channel interference and intra sub channel interference all of that got very neatly very compactly replaced in this fashion. And if you want to take it even one step further then you can actually say that this is how it looks like in the final scheme of things. S naught getting transmitted at one end is showing up at the other end with a effect of a noise term which is eta naught dash of n which is 
eta naught of n divided by c naught that is it and this shows up at the other end with a, as s naught hat of n. The only thing is it is like an AWGN channel where uh, there is nothing all other impairments have been uh, removed and likewise you can draw the second channel s1 hat of n this input the the noise term is eta 1 of n divided by c1 and that comes out as s1 hat of n dot 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 the final channel as input noise this is eta m minus 1 of n divided by c m minus 1 and this is the final one. Okay, so, very simple, very elegant, this is what it is all about. If you have done the and uh, this sort of uh, gives us a, uh, a very good feel for why OFDM is so popular because you can now extend this to any number, any m you want. You can say uh, uh, 1024 to uh, uh, 2048, whatever you want depending upon and how many channels you will choose depends on your channel dispersion and that is something that you can decide. So, this is the reason why OFDM has become so popular. There is almost no complexity in this one because uh, computing the DFT at the transmitter easy, you can do a fast algorithm, fast transform at the receiver another fast transform and then just some scaling that happens and now what tells you that you can transmit on channel 0 and not on channel number 1? What is it that will make you decide one way or the other? Value of C naught. Okay, if C naught is very small what will happen? It looks like that particular channel has got a lot of noise because C1 is the denominator and your power allocation algorithm would have said hey, do not waste your power transmitting on this channel, remove that from the equation. So, basically you are you are uh, you are uh, having an advantage over that. So, uh, this is this is this is OFDM, this is in a nutshell uh, the the uh, big big advantage uh, with the, the OFDM and how we how we look at the, the complete thing. So, let us summarize. So, the summary is that uh, we have at the transmitter we have to do the modulation and that will happen through the filter bank that does the TDM to FDM conversion. So, basically we must have this set of filters at the transmitter f m minus 1 of z. There are m filters that we have to do and what we have done is uh, we have taken it to be the IDFT matrix. Okay. IDFT matrix if you were to describe it uh, in a mathematical term it is an m cross m transform, but if you were to give it the filter bank interpretation this is what an m channel DFT filter bank correct DFT filter bank where the prototype filter is F naught of n is given by 1 1 1 it is a rectangular window of dimension m. Okay. So, basically it is a the filter length is equal to m all the coefficients are equal to 1 and uh, we basically get this. So, if you did this and then go back to the uh, the original diagram what you will find is that you will find that the g of z matrix which you which, which we had is now basically the idft matrix that is all that is left in it okay and so it is no longer g of z it is actually a constant matrix it is not g of z it is no longer a, a, a polynomial it is only the idft matrix Okay, so, uh, similarly in the same manner at the, at the receiver we have to have a filter bank which is H naught of Z all the way to H m minus 1 of Z and this is uh, we have introduced using uh, we have uh, introduced using as a, a, a DFT filter bank and this case it is the DFT matrix. Why did the DFT matrix become the DFT matrix? Why did we have, why did it become that? 
remember we did type 2 polyphase decomposition there is a type 1 type 2 difference and that is why one is the uh, this will become different compared to the. So, uh, basically you can you can verify that once you uh, implement it as a type 2 you will get a DFT metric. So, here it here is a summary if you go back to the original uh, diag diagram uh, you can show that G is equal to W inverse S is equal to the DFT matrix and of course, the dimensionality of the transforms very important it is m cross m the increase in the dimensionality the redundancy comes through either uh, through cyclic prefix uh, addition it is not through uh, using a larger transformation. So, again uh, keep keep that uh, keep that picture in mind ok. So, given this we now have a complete picture of OFDM. OFDM is a very powerful uh, modulation scheme. It is one where we have a wide band channel, we have split into several narrow band channels, channel has been split into narrow band channels, okay. narrow band channels, the number of narrow band channels is M. Okay, and we are making sure that the, the transmission happens with redundancy and when we use the OFDM based structure this becomes M parallel channels, M parallel channels each with different SNR, each with different SNR ok and the minute you know that you have different SNRs you know that the best thing to do is water filling and once you do water filling you can get the maximum information through and basically uh, via water filling you maximize throughput you not only do that you, you remove those channels which are not good uh, maximize throughput or you can say that uh, you optimize your transmission. Once you have that at the receiver uh, you are able to uh, recover. So, the beauty of OFDM so, this is OFDM, the beauty of OFDM is low complexity, you have removed the complexity of the equalizer all you have to do is 1 over C naught, 1 over C 1 that is a very simple operation compute the DFT of the channel and then uh, 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 and the, the it also achieves or maximizes throughput, achieves maximum throughput via water filling all of that which we have studied. Okay, so, this is this is why OFDM is so attractive, this is why 4G, 5G, uh, your Wi-Fi everyone wants to use OFDM uh, this is. So, but there is a saying in uh, in business terms that there is no free lunch right, that means that somewhere you have got to pay, you cannot get something which has got you know low complexity, low high good performance, where is the penalty, where is the penalty. It turns out that uh, what we are what we are uh, generating when we complete uh, after we do the uh, uh, the inverse DFT uh, is as if we are adding many parallel channels right basically all of them are modulated and uh, the peak to average variation is very large. So, the only drawback that we have with OFDM if you want to write down as a negative is the peak to average power ratio, peak to average power ratio uh, and that will affect your power amplifier efficiency that will affect your overall uh, total power uh, required for your uh, receiver uh, peak to average uh, uh, power ratio PAPR and there are techniques by which we can address the PAPR issue, but th this is probably the only penalty that you pay and then uh, most of the time we say that ok uh, and this becomes more severe as M increases ok. So, PAPR will will become more severe as M. So, more number of channels or larger the DFT size the the more difficult uh, becomes the. Uh, so, uh, this is this is uh, advantage that we have to, uh, to live with and uh, it is not a, a big disadvantage, disadvantage uh, and there are some techniques that are known to be able to reduce the PAPR. But next important element is uh, where do we use OFDM and look at a very practical example. So, probably the technology that all of you are using your phones are using is uh, 802.11, you create a hotspot 
several people connect. Okay, that's uh, using uh, 802.11 technology. It could be 802.11b or it could be a or g. We are looking at primarily a and g. A is the technology that works in the 5 gigahertz band. It is based on OFDM. G is the one that works in the 2.4 gigahertz band also based on OFDM. These are the two that we are going to be looking at today. And you will see very, very quickly uh, everything that we have studied actually kind of falls into place. Okay? Uh, the total bandwidth of the modulated signal total bandwidth is uh, 20 megahertz. It uses 20 megahertz. Um, there are, uh, it is about 300 megahertz is available altogether. So, total available is around 300 megahertz. So, you can divide 300 by 20 and you can say so many uh, channels are available, but what is of interest is what happens inside the 20 megahertz. That is the transmission part. Now, rather than transmitting as 20 megahertz as a single carrier, the design of 802.11 does the following. It says I want to design it as a 64 subcarrier system or sub channel system, 64 subcarriers, which means that I will use uh, IDFT, DFT size of uh, 64. And it also specifies the following things. If you go in and read the standard, it will say that out of these 64, 48 will be used for data, that is uh, user information. 12 of them will be used as uh, what we call as guard bands because your spectrum tends to spill because you are using a, a, a rectangular window. Uh, it has a, it has, it basically the rectangular window has, as you know, has got a uh, very, very slow roll off. So, you, you do not want to cause interference outside your 20 megahertz. So, they use guard bands. Okay, so, 6 in the beginning, 6 at the end are used and then there are 4 channels on which you send pilot information. Pilot information, the minute you see pilot that means it is known information, it is not unknown. The reason known information is transmitted is so that you can estimate the channel and why do you need to estimate the channel? Because you can do the 1 over C not, 1 over C not, 1 over C 1 at the transmitter. So, pilot is used for channel estimation. So, pilot uh, uh, for channel estimation. Okay. So, this is, this is the structure of the pilot symbols for channel estimation, channel estimation. So, you get your 64 channels there. Okay. So, now uh, uh, very, very important uh, how do we uh, decide on the rest of the system. Okay. So, the sub carrier sub channel bandwidth, uh, sub channel bandwidth is uh, 20 megahertz divided by 64, that is the number of sub channels that will give you 312.5 kilohertz. Okay. And this is a system where we use a cyclic prefix, it is designed to carry a cyclic prefix of 16 samples. How many data samples will be there? 64 because you are using a uh, IDFT of size 64. To that you will add 16, so it will become 80 samples. 80 samples will become your block length and that will become the, uh, the, the frame or the OFDM symbol that you are transmitting. So, one OFDM symbol, one OFDM symbol is going to be 64 plus the cyclic prefix of 16, this is the cyclic prefix the 64 is the data. You can see the redundancy coming in. So, basically this will be equal to 80 samples that is what is going to be that is going to be transmitted. Okay. Now, what is the duration of one symbol? One symbol. Uh, this is a very, very important um, element because uh, what we are looking at is uh, what is the rate at which the, the channel is going to be exercised. Okay. So, basically the, the bandwidth of the channel is 20 megahertz. So, which means that uh, as far as the, uh, the, the symbols are, uh, are the, the, uh, the, if you were to look at uh, and you think of it as a single carrier system, you will be signaling at a baud rate which is with a duration which will be the reciprocal of the bandwidth. 20 into 10 power 6. Okay. So, uh, basically 
what is the duration of the OFDM symbol? OFDM symbol will be uh, 80 times TS, right? So, duration of OFDM symbol, duration of OFDM symbol, one OFDM symbol which basically corresponds to 64 of these, uh, 64 of the channel uh, usage, uh, usage uh, this thing. So, uh, but basically we are going to use 80, uh, 80 uh, uh, samples are going to be transmitted is going to be roughly uh, I think um, what does it come out to be 1 over 1 over 20 into 10, uh, 10 to 10 power minus uh, 10 power 6 and uh, multiplied by 80 I think this comes out to be around 4 microseconds you can just verify that. Okay. Now, uh, the, the key element is uh, what is the uh, multipath, uh, how much multipath protection do you have? I have 16 samples of, uh, of cyclic prefix. So, basically I have protected myself against uh, uh, the, uh, so that maximum um, delay spread that I can withstand, tau max. Basically my number of cyclic, my cyclic prefix should be longer than my delay spread. So, 16 times TS approximately that is what I have protected myself against. So, uh, this comes out to be 16, uh, wait, this is uh, 16 times this thing. Did I get my, uh, this 4 microseconds correct? Is that correct? Okay, 16 times TS, what will that come out to be? 0.8, okay, 0.8 microseconds. Now, we said I know, somewhere I think when we are talking about multipath and other things, we said that typical uh, delay spreads uh, is of the order of 5 microseconds, okay, typical multipath, typical multipath in outdoor environments, typical multipath delay spread in outdoor environments is approximately around around uh, uh, 3, 4, 5 microseconds, let us write down as 5 microseconds, okay, which means you have not allowed for enough or for your this thing, why did they design it such a way, any idea, OFDM or sorry uh, 802.11 was not designed for outdoors, it was designed only for indoors and indoors what do you see? a few nanoseconds is what you see. So, they have actually designed it very well for indoor. Now, if you take and deploy this outside, it may or may not work depending upon how much multipath you are seeing. Sometimes you may say what is this, it, uh, it worked very well indoors, it did not work outside, Why? because cyclic prefix was not enough and you ran into and into trouble. Okay. So, that is one, uh, one element of it. Okay. Now, uh, if you go back and read the 802.11 standard, 802.11 A bar G standard, it tell you that they have forward error correction or error correcting codes and the rates of these codes can vary between one half, one, uh, two thirds and three fourths, okay. And the modulation methods options that you have, modulation options that you have can go from BPSK which means one bit per symbol. QPSK 2 bits per symbol, it can you can do 16 qualm 4 bits per symbol and you can do 64 qualm which is 6 bits per symbol. I will just write the within the bracket what how many bits per symbol I am going. So, this is 2 1 2 4 6 bits per symbol, okay. So, what is the minimum rate that you will get on an 802.11 system? Minimum rate means most robust. So, what is the rather than calling it minimum rate, let us give it a positive uh, flavor. What is the most robust scheme that you can do? Of course, ro most robust means you will say choose BPSK and you will say combine it with rate one half coding, right? That is what we would like to do. So, here is the calculation for the minimum rate. I have 48 data carriers, okay, and each time I transmit. Uh, one symbol on the channel, the information that I actually am carrying because it is a rate one half code is actually a rate one half. So, I have to uh, reduce it by that factor, only half of it is information, okay. And basically, uh, I am carrying one channel bit, one channel bit per sub carrier symbol. 
subcarrier symbol. Each of those 48 subcarriers, each of them is carrying a BPSK symbol. So I'm getting one one channel. Out of that, uh, one half of it is only information bit. Okay, into and one subcarrier symbol. One subcarrier symbol every four microseconds divided by 4 microseconds okay is my calculation clear 48 subcarriers each of those subcarriers is carrying one bit of information because the, I am using a BPSK transmission but only one half of it is information because it is encoded with rate one half and each subcarrier symbol is carried uh, these 48 subcarrier symbols are carried in 4 microseconds okay if you do this calculation it will come out to be 6 megabits per second that is your most robust scheme okay. So what is your maximum throughput scheme? Maximum throughput scheme you can write it down almost by inspection 48 into 3 by 4 that is the information rate into 6 channel bits per subcarrier uh, uh, symbol into 1 over 4 microseconds this we cannot change okay if you do this 54 megabits per second okay go and look at your router it will say rated for 54 megabits per second that is it that is where you get it from okay and uh, how, how, how is it done uh, you have taken 20 megahertz 20 megahertz the first 6 and the last six were guard bands okay I, I have not drawn enough number but you can these are the guard bands okay now apart from that there are uh, 48 uh, uh, 48 uh, uh, channels which are carrying information so there are information carrying and then occasionally you will find a, inf a channel which is carrying pilot information so basically some number followed by a pilot followed by another pilot dot 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 okay so total of 64 and this is why this is how it is designed and this is how it is developed so again the uh, the technology that uh, we have used is uh, is absolutely uh, scalable to any bandwidth that you want uh, and uh, achieve the data rates that you're looking at basically uh, this is this is all there is to the design of the system and you can also tell whether a system will work well in indoor outdoor by looking at how many cp if you now if you wanted to modify this to trans use it in a outdoor environment what would you do you would have to add more cyclic prefix where will the where will you pay the penalty this 4 microseconds may become 5 microseconds the same amount of information now with more cyclic prefix what will happen you will need more information and more time to transmit that information so which means that you will your throughputs are going to go down okay but it's a it's a trade off that you can make to make a system design work well okay so the last element is that what if you have not studied multi rate signal processing what, uh, all this is fine right we, we we came up with a very elegant method so does it mean that uh, people could not would not have uh, you know come up with the OFDM okay so let us look at it assume arrays multi rate signal processing you have not taken multi rate signal all you have done is basic DSP and you have done communications okay here it is so this is the conventional thought process conventional okay conventional says input output relationship is always a convolution okay C of n convolved with X of n x of n you put in redundancy whatever it is you want to do okay uh, now if I have done cyclic prefix with CP I hope you will recall that x of n with CP actually becomes a, looks like a periodic signal we call it x tilde because you know the, the data kind of looks like wrap around now you may say well I did not really extend it beyond a certain point it is not necessary because you are going to observe the convolution only over a uh, finite duration so this looks like it is fine so the input output relationship now becomes y of n is equal to summation k equal to 0 through nu c subscript k x tilde x of n minus k right 
So basically, uh, and of course you can you can verify that uh, this is nothing but x of n minus k modulo modulo m. Okay, so which means that uh, your interpretations will have to be done, and you can actually show that uh, the, the, the linear convolution is actually circular convolution. Okay, so uh, effectively one uh, frame of the output r of n can be written as c of n is no longer just linear convolution, it is actually circular convolution with one period or just that uh, basic uh, uh, frame x of n. Okay, so, this is the time domain. Again, I may be a little bit sloppy in my notation, but it is the concept that is uh, most important. Now, can you define, can you uh, express this equation in, in DFT terms? Circular convolution. So, which means R of k is equal to C of k times x of k. Correct? Okay. So, it is DFT of C, the channel uh, matrix C and it is the uh, DFT of the of x, basically it is the vector uh, uh, without the cyclic prefix, basically you have taken that portion of it because that is the part that you will have to take the DFT of, multiply the 2 and then uh, write down the uh, write down the expression. So, basically what we would uh, write down this equation as R of n would have to be I DFT of dft of c c nu okay that's that you have to if you you have to write it as a diagonal matrix c not to c m minus 1 write it and follow multiplied by dft of x okay so that would be x x not x m minus 1 okay okay so uh, again i am just quickly sort of getting giving you the flavor of the uh, the conventional approach okay so here is this is what you would have done to catch capture the uh, circular convolution i have to take the idft of it now very quickly look at the 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 uh, the steps what did we say x of n was going to be x of n was going to be idft of something okay idft of s of n okay this x of n was going to be idft of s of n okay that's what we were going to do at the at, at the transmitter side so idft of s of n so basically this dft can be can be removed because dft times idft will will can, will cancel each other so then this equation this part of it will become s of n okay and followed by dft of the c coefficients followed by idft so if i were to write here idft c not c not through C m minus 1 and then I tell you okay at the output y of n is equal to d of t of r of n okay. So, which means that you will take this whole thing and then multiply it by d of t this and this will cancel and will, if there is a noise term there it will become d of t of the noise term eta of n and then you tell me you you took so many lectures to explain this i knew this from traditional communications right i mean nothing nothing complicated what is it it's parallel channels c not c m minus 1 there is not nothing very sophisticated about your derivation i have to defend against that accusation right so now you turn down and ask the communications engineer Okay, now what is your uh, spectral leakage? 13 dB, very bad, very bad spectral. Leakage. So, and and where did you show? Where where did it actually show up? Remember how many channels I had to uh, put as guard bands in my 802.11? I I did what? Six channels on either side, 12 channels. You could have you wasted bandwidth. So they say, okay, uh, I want to 
reduce the spectral leakage. The communication engine looks at it and says, I can't do anything about it. It's DFT, IDFT, I can't do anything about it. You say, change that. What is so sacred about DFT? It's just a M cross. It says, wait, 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 wait. I have no way of doing anything because what will happen? You change DFT to something else, what will happen? I do not know what happens to circular convolution, I do not know how to deal with, you know, I have, I am basically stuck with the fact that uh, all I can do is this. Ask the multi-rate signal processing person what to do with it, he will say, well, this is it, G of Z is what you were trying to design, okay. What did you do in the, in the process? You actually, we, you made it as? W inverse, right? You made it W inverse, but nothing said that it has to be just W inverse in our structure. You could have very well have done W inverse lambda times E of Z, which we know is a DFT matrix, and then you can design any type of uh, roll off that you want. You can design a system that has got all the benefits. Right, it's got the benefits because what DFT, IDFT, those will cancel each other. Now you have to be a little bit careful on how you deal with E of Z. You may have to impose certain constraints, but at the end of the day, you now have a flexible framework. So, was it worth going through the multi-rate signal processing approach? I hope you will agree. The answer is yes, because if you were only interested in OFDM, the way it is, the basic, the plain version of OFDM, the communications would have given it to you in five minutes. So basically, you please clean up this uh, notation. You will find that the basic information is here on this one slide. You don't have to go through uh, CP. You don't have to go through the circulant matrix. All of that. But actually, when you have that perspective, that is. So this is what we now in the 5G system is called a filter bank multi-carrier, multi-carrier, FBMC, okay. That it is no longer just OFDM, OFDM is just one, one variant of a filter bank multi-carrier, but then you can design it to be a whole family of filters which are called, uh, that is what is called by FBMC and this is one of the key topics that is being discussed in the context of 5G, but again. In, as far as our course is concerned, we conclude the chapter on OFDM saying it is one of the best methods of transmission, but you can extend it beyond where it is today if you come at it from the multi-rate approach and then design it using the filter design tools that are available to us. Thank you. In the conventional derivation, yes, because uh, in the in, in the in the thing is uh, in this process, uh, the circular convolution will come only if you have the cyclic prefix inserted. If you don't have it, then you cannot write it in. The, so yes, the cyclic pre, the redundancy comes in in the conventional method also. So if you use the last method, yeah, the one. yes. Yes, so you, the, you will start getting some conditions that will be on E of Z so that you can get uh, proper reconstruction of the things, yes. So uh, basically there will be a matrix E on the transmit side, there will be another matrix on the, and the product of those must have certain properties. But it turns out that uh, that result comes from M channel uh, perfect reconstruction filter banks already have solved, that is a known problem. What, what those, what should those polyphase component matrices be? That is a known result. So again, we can just borrow that result from there, okay? Thank you.